Hey folks, Randy Newberg here from Frigid Southeast Idaho. Uh, we're going to do a podcast today and uh, you're probably saying, well, why Southeast Idaho? Uh, Marcus Hockett, our production director, who uh, I think you were, uh, you're going to be on back-to-back podcast, Marcus. We just... Oh loaded. yeah, the Colorado Elk one was, yeah, that was, was the last a, one. I, I kind of got out of sequence and I ended up loading that one up. Nice. Okay. So... Anyhow, Marcus and I are down here in Southeast Idaho, and uh, we are uh, chasing archery mule deer. Chasing being the key word by the looks of it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At least this afternoon it was. But anyhow, this is Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, thanks to the great folks at Leupold for uh, being the title sponsor of this podcast, of our TV show, of pretty much anything associated with Randy Newberg. Great company, great products. Uh, just They are committed to the self-guided public land hunter, and I'm committed to them. So... We, uh, <clears throat> Marcus and I are down here. We got down here yesterday afternoon. We spent, we, we went out for what, three hours yesterday? Yeah, it was at least three hours yeah. driving around. And we did not see a deer. We were trying to learn <laughs> the unit. By the time we were done, we had chained up, we got stuck going up the mountain in the snow in a really bad road and it all rutted up. So we chained up the back and we made it about another 400 yards. So, um, we me. we uh, petered out right before the top there. Yeah. And then Marcus said, you know, I usually chain up all four. And I said, all right. So <laughs> we crawled under and chained up all four and we got to the crest and it was getting towards dark. So we turned around, came back, didn't see any deer, saw two tracks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but the good news was we'd crossed off probably half of the map that I'd brought of, okay, here's areas we might find deer. Yeah. There was, there was no deer there. I, well, there was, there, there were a couple of tracks. Yeah. So but, there had been at one time. But they weren't there anymore. No. <laughs> yeah so <clears throat> anyhow uh we're, we're here and we're gonna we're gonna podcast tonight and we're hoping that in the next two and a half days we arrow a big buck or a little buck or a buck and then we're gonna podcast about how we pulled that off but before we get into this i want to thank the great folks at orion coolers um you've heard me talk about them they're the best coolers i've found i've been living out of them i've been beating them abusing them using them um gosh I'm, we found some more uses for them when we were doing when we were boiling uh that elk antler or elk skull oh yeah in, balancing in out the yeah. the back tines there yeah <clears throat> yeah i mean pretty good yeah if you're a taxidermist you need uh some orion coolers also <laughs> <laughs> we we're, we're marcus and i were doing a youtube video about uh, how to do a european mount on an elk skull and uh the orion coolers just came in really darn handy for that too but um anyhow go to their website oriancoolers.com and you will find out why they're the best coolers out there uh one of the ways i found out about this hunt is through a service called gohunt.com. Uh, I'd been doing a lot of research, and I, I would say of all the research tools that I use when it comes to applications and tags, uh, I, I used to, up until gohunt came out two years ago, I, I tried all kinds of things. But now I'm 99% of my time is spent with them. And uh, this hunt popped up on the radar when I used their filtering system. And I said, well, what the heck? I'm going to apply. And uh, the, they have this system called the Insider. There, it's a, a feature to their website. You go to gohunt.com, click on the Insider, and if you use the promo code RANDY, R-A-N-D-Y, uh, you're going to get a $50 Sportsman's Warehouse gift card. Now, be thinking about this because this podcast is going to load up sometime in early December. Uh, Alaska's deadline is up right now. Uh, uh, I think Alaska's deadline is December 10th, something like that. But once Alaska passes, then we're jumping into all the Western states and that's where go hunt really focuses. January 31st is Wyoming elk and you going elk hunt in Wyoming this year, Marcus? 
I I don't plan on it. You and, don't? Well, unless I mean I'm with you, obviously. Well, maybe I'm you filming need, it. Maybe, I won't be personally elk hunting, but uh, well, maybe uh, we need to do a party app. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have two bonus points. I think I got one. Okay. So, so, I'll, I'll, <laughs> so you drag me down a little pretty bit. Pretty limited, no. <laughs> but so uh, you use go hunt and go to their insider and use it, and uh, you'll be amazed at the information it provides. Definitely the best drawing odds of any service out there. Not even close. Um, all kinds of other information that you need when you're doing this research. Uh, and if you kind of look at my calendar, it goes, okay, we got Wyoming elk end of January. Then we jump right into Arizona deer and antelope. And then we jump into Utah and Montana, Colorado, New Mexico. And by the time mid April comes along, all those applications are done. And I'm not the kind of guy who's just going to wing it. I'm, I'm researching right now when we're on the road, I got my insider pulled up on my laptop because I got to get 10 to 12 tags a year and uh, go hunt helps me do it. So anyhow, that's, that's how we're down here on this hunt. And, uh, you know, we were talking Marcus about how I had this really big map of where we were going to go Yeah, from Onyx maps. You've got it on your phone. I, yeah. I'm, I'm the old kind of dinosaur in a tar pit. I, I got the old handheld GPS with the chip in it, but I think you were, download on your phone don't you have to download the map if you don't have service yeah yeah you have to download the map uh but what you want to make sure is that you have enough room on your phone that's where i messed up is uh yeah. my phone was a little full yeah he, <laughs> so. Mar- marcus has all these pictures and videos and, and audios and everything else i so anyhow uh you could have you didn't have to download the whole unit after, no, after, I just down. After. I started downloading. I downloaded the portion that we were we were using. Okay, and then uh, it works really good when you have service. And then the stuff I do have downloaded works great, but I just ran out of storage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I need to do it. I'm sitting here with my phone. I've got the account. I've got everything. And when we were in Wyoming last week, Matt from Onyx Maps was looking at me like, Randy, why do you still use that old GPS? But uh, it's just. I don't know, security blanket, old habits, <laughs> die hard, uh, old dog, new tricks. All, all those kind of sayings apply to me. And that's uh, kind of nice to have both, really. I it mean, is because the GPS is like, you yeah, know, the, I don't know. the layers is. that you have on your phone when we're out there yeah. are way better than what I get on my GPS. Mm-hmm. Way, way better. I mean, all of the just everything is, yeah. is way better, way easier to use. Yeah. But because then when your phone dies too, which happens if you are an iPhone user, your phone will die. Yeah. When it's cold. So yeah. having the GPS backup is, is pretty, oh. pretty nice. Do, do they die easy? Cause I'm a Samsung guy. Oh yeah. Guy. If it gets cold, it's just like, it's done. Really? It just like turns oh. off. So you just got to like carry it in. Yeah. You like put it in your pocket or okay. I carry a little battery pack so I can power it up but yeah well anyhow on x map so if 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 we would have known how bad that first part of the unit was you wouldn't have needed much disk space or storage space on your phone because we could have cut about half of it away yeah exactly but (laughs) oh well anyhow folks on xmaps.com great product unbelievable product um Use promo code Randy16 and you're going to get 20% off any of their app products. And uh, over the course of this winter, I'm going to become, I'm going to get converted. I'm going to see the light, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to get baptized. I I will be a smartphone user next year at this time. You going to hold me to that? Marcus just gave me this look like, I'll believe it when I see it. He didn't say well, it, but... Yeah, we, we should get your phone hooked up because you can put a little chip in your phone, right? The little micro SD. I don't know. Oh. I think so. That, it's, that's it's an S6. Right yeah, okay. Well, when I use my phone right now, it, it tells me like I've got only 30 gigs left. Oh, I have like... I was down to like megabytes. This is what I was running <laughs> out of the problem. Uh, so... <clears throat> One of the things we want to do on this podcast is catch up on all the deer hunting we've been doing because let's see, folks heard the Nevada deer hunt about me and getting the cactus in my butt. <laughs> that, that Obviously a lot of people heard that one because uh, I can't believe how many emails and Facebook and uh, hunt talk threads popped up about 
Hey, Randy, I want to see those pictures of, of you standing there in your uh, buck naked Duluth Trading Company BVDs and and the Spitzer and Jones pulling p- cactus quills out of your hind end. So I know a lot of people listen to that one. So we don't need to rehash that deer hunt. And then we did the Colorado elk hunt. So since that time, you, you we, we gave Marcus a break. Uh, he'd been on the road all all fall just about and so tyler our other uh field producer he uh he filled in for a week in southeast montana me and my buddy dick ferguson and the idea was and everybody needs to go to southeast montana i'll just say that right now southeast montana when it comes to deer hunting is like uh, they're almost like gophers there (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> at least right now when when the numbers are high and i know my friends who hunt down there are going to say newberg shut up but here's the deal there are millions of acres of public land because there's the custer gallatin national forest there there i don't know how much blm land is there there's a lot um, lots yeah and when i say southeast montana i'm talking like south of the yellowstone river or south of i-94 and east of uh billings uh i-90 with wyoming as a southern boundary and north south dakota as the eastern boundary so those areas there they're general areas for so if you get the montana deer tag um and the draw odds for the last five years have been 100 percent if you apply before the deadline and you know it's been kind of funny marcus is you know we've always in montana for the last five years we've had those leftover tags yeah and everybody's like oh i'll just buy a tag if i don't draw somewhere else well this year i think when the deer tags went on sale in may they got snapped up the first morning every deer tag was yeah that's gone. so <clears throat> yeah if, if you're thinking about doing it folks don't drag your feet and when you see the episode with me and my buddy dick you're you're gonna say i want to go do that hey i think people probably can hear this train going by here we're (laughs) it's it's supposed to get down to five degrees tonight so we're not doing tents tonight we're in a motel and uh there's a couple things there's you can hear there's a train right behind us here it's like my cousin Vinny when he's sleeping and the train goes by and he jumps up that's how it's like sleeping in this hotel but that's all right it's warm (laughs) it's not free but it's warm it's close to free (laughs) but uh uh, gosh where was i going before the train whistle blew southeast montana yeah, yeah um when we were down there uh dick came from minnesota he, so he bought the non-resident tag and i think if people realized and we're going to down this podcast we're going to bump into quite a few opportunity hunts that people could go and do because i'm just surprised how few people take advantage of all of these general over-the-counter leftover second choice tags to hunt these deer in these western states i think everyone focuses on elk or the you know moose goat and sheep or something and the deer kind of become this leftover, oh, I'll get around to it sort of thing. Here it is, first week of December. We're still deer hunting. Yep. Everyone else has been, has their, they've been done for six weeks and we're still deer hunting. So, but uh, Southeast Montana is one of those situations. In addition to the Forest Service, in addition to the BLM land there, there's also state trust land in montana two out of every two square miles out of every 36 square miles is uh state trust land that's the blue stuff on your map and you can hunt that because when you buy your hunting license we're paying for what is it called an access enhancement fee or something like that. yeah i think that's what it's called yeah and so if 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 you can't find enough room to hunt in those places the odds are you can't read a map uh and if even that doesn't work, Montana has what's called block management program. And that's where private landowners are paid by Fish, Wildlife, and Parks for the impacts of uh, uh, allowing public hunting. And I don't know how many acres are in southeast Montana, but I think it's more than any region. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. Region. That's called Region 7. If you, And I apologize that Montana's got probably the most complicated set of regulations for a non-resident. I, I get so many emails from non-residents saying, can you guys make this any more complicated? 
But if you're looking at your your map and your rules, Region 7 is what you're looking for. And so if it's Region 7, all of the units within the region start with a 7. And it's... It's a general deer tag, so there, it's not like you got to draw the some limited entry permit or anything like that. And here's the crazy part. Six weeks of archery, and if you don't fill your tag, you come back a week later for the start of five weeks of rifle. Yep. It's... <laughs> And a lot of times people are like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. So you Montana guys who are listening to this, the rest of the world cannot believe that we get to hunt deer and elk for 11 weeks on a general tag, which covers most of the state. Well, and it's, in a lot of states, people aren't even hunting deer every year. Yeah. Like we right. get to hunt them every year right. and for six weeks of archery and five weeks of rifle, which is crazy. Yeah. So in this part of Montana, you can shoot either sex whitetail, which I shot a, a whitetail buck, or you can shoot buck mule deer. And I think there, there's, there, there were giving away a ton of mule deer doe tags there down yeah. in southeast this year. And then you can always buy the Region 7 over-the-counter resident and non-resident, a Region 7 whitetail doe tag. Yeah. And you, you whitetail hunters from the Midwest, why you guys aren't hunting whitetails in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, I have no idea. Hey, when, when we did this Southeast Montana one, because Dick was coming from Minnesota, he'd never shot a mule deer before. He said, oh, I just want a, you know, three and a half year old mule deer and call it good. And I wanted to show people, look, you can kind of do the either or the, you can have your cake and eat it too. Um, you can come here and white tails or mule deer. So I shot a really nice white tail buck in Southeast Montana and it, the, the great plains, Montana, probably the Dakotas, Wyoming, somewhat Eastern Colorado, and, and even the mountain States, uh, it's really winter dependent. We haven't had a hard winter in Montana since 2010 and 11, I think. Yep. That was a, yeah, so, a bad one. Yeah. It's going to be, let's see, six years ago. And so, yeah, we lost pretty much that whole fawn crop that would have been born in 2011. Not all, but a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And so those are the, this year were the five-year-old deer. And uh, there were still plenty of five-year-old deer, deer, Dick shot one that was five and a half, um, his mule deer. But when we have mild winters like we've had the last five years in these places, the number of deer is crazy. And if we sneak by with another easy winter, which so far, I mean, we have in Montana and Wyoming. And has it has it snowed up there yet? I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've hardly been home. So, but <clears throat> no, there's, there's hardly any snow on the ground. Yeah. It, it hasn't been cold. So, you know, if it stays this way, we're going to have another easy winter. And I will predict that 2017 is going to be the best deer season Montana's had in a long, long time. It's, if it's anything like what I saw when I was over there this year. And I know a lot of people are like, well, I didn't see that much. Well, a lot of the guys I saw driving the roads on their ATV or on their truck driving the roads. And I don't care whether it's whitetails, mule deer, whatever, elk. You just got to get out and get a little ways away. I mean, we where Dick shot his mule deer, we maybe went, well, he shot it like three quarter of a mile from the trailhead, but you had to climb a pretty steep ridge. And we could hear cars driving by and every once in a while he'd hear a shot over by the road where some dude must have been road hunting or something. And <laughs> once we got back there, you know, we were, sometimes we were a couple miles away. We were seeing all kinds of nice bucks, not huge whoppers, but you know, nice bucks to shoot a five and a half year old meal there. And that's a nice buck. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so that's, uh, that, that's one people are going to see on, on TV show next year is Dick shot that. And then I ended up shooting a really nice, it's only a four by four whitetail, but it's kind of palmated and heavy mass on one side. And then it's got a really cool cheater point on the other side. And, he was right in amongst a group of mule deer. It was him and two white tail does and probably 20 mule deer does and one little mule deer buck all in this little three acre 
little pocket. And uh, so when you go to to places like uh, Southeast Montana, you can, you can shoot either, whatever gets in the way or whatever you want to shoot. And uh, so that 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 goes to the to the next part of of just how much deer opportunity there is. And when you had your week off, Marcus, when when we were in yeah. Southeast Montana, you were in Central Montana. Yeah. And you shot your biggest mule deer ever. Yep. <laughs> Public land. <laughs> yes. Self guided. Yep. You had to pack it out. Yep. Was not next to a road. Actually, it was next to a road, but it was a closed road that nobody could be. <laughs> oh, okay. So it was gated. It had yeah, there was, there was nobody that could drive that road. But. Okay. Cool. So what do you have? Two mile, three mile pack? Yeah, it was around two miles, a little over two miles. Oh, well, that's ain't nothing to that. No, it was. Uh, I mean, normally you're carrying all that camera gear around. No, it was about the same. Throwing yeah. a mule deer on your back. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I didn't pack it out a whole lot. Yeah. Took multiple trips and got some help for the second load. So yeah. What did you see? A lot of deer. I saw a ton of deer. It was crazy. There was yeah. a lot, there was a lot of deer in there too. Have so you, had you hunted in that area before? Uh, kind of. We went there earlier this year. Yeah. Um, and then I've, I've been in the area a lot, but okay. I haven't personally hunted it, I guess. Okay. Have, have you, do you think that it's kind of, as I was referring to earlier, that these easy winners are? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. They're definitely coming. They're coming back up. I mean, it seemed like the mule deer, especially were down a lot yeah, a few no. years back and it's good to see a lot of does, a lot of, a lot of little bucks and a few big bucks running around too. So that's good yeah. to see hopefully well, hopefully it continues and hopefully yeah. they don't i hope so i i'd love to have us you know get a, a 10 year stretch between those just absolute wipeout winners it's and you know i look at colorado i think they had a really terrible winter 2007 2008 and then they got hit with another one two thousand when we had 2010 and 11 um some of the states have had really tough winters three out of or two out of three years or two out of five years and that just boy that's hard on deer but right now across the west at least most of the places where winter is the big factor deer numbers are crazy and you can't stockpile them so <laughs> get your butt out here next year and start hunting some of them I, it's i don't know i i tell people if you don't fill your deer tag in montana you spent your whole hunt at the bar <laughs> yeah or you were picky so. okay right i mean <laughs> that would be a, a you know you know that's an acceptable reason not to fill your tag if someone doesn't want to do that i i get that but i i don't know how you could come and hunt deer and go for a four or five mile hike and not have a chance to fill your deer tag unless you just hike down the shoulder of the interstate or it something. does happen though because we went hunting on thanksgiving day by missoula and we hiked eight miles and we yeah. did not see a single deer really so i don't know anything about the missoula area so this was we were obviously in the wrong spot though really huh <laughs> but you know go to central or eastern montana and you'd be pretty hard pressed not to run into a deer yeah <laughs> about wow. any piece of public land that you find so you guys went for eight miles and you didn't see a deer yeah, I, it might not have been quite eight miles. It's somewhere, it was, you know, we hiked wow. like four miles in. So Was it whitetail country or mule deer country? Both. Hmm. Both, yeah. So who knows? Huh. Were you the guide or was someone else? Well, we were with Kara's brother. but uh, Your so, brother, your brother-in-law? Yeah, my brother-in-law, okay. yeah. Okay. Huh. Well, you can't say any. You can't blame him because then your wife will be mad. <laughs> so you've, Marcus has been married less than a year. And he's got the marriage thing pretty well dialed in for only being married a year. But the first rule is you never talk bad about your in-laws. <laughs> you can feel bad about them, but you can't talk bad about them, especially on a nationally syndicated podcast. That, <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be good. So, But you can kind of blame them. I mean, you always blame the guy who put the plan together, right? There you go, yeah. No. So. Well, there there had been deer there before. I know he shot a deer there last year. Okay, so. and there were tracks. There were some tracks. There were some All right. Huh. No, Western Montana is a hard place to it hunt. It is. It is. I mean, I grew up hunting Southwest Montana, and 
Yeah. I mean, if we saw a three point mule deer, that was something to get excited about. Right. For sure. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of them, but they're just not, the age class isn't really there. Right. And you get over in that Missoula country and further north or further west, and it's just so thick. It's kind of like northern Idaho. It's Yeah, that's the thing, too. You'll see tracks and you'll see sign, but yeah. finding the deer, it's a tricky yeah. business. Those guys who consistently have success in northwest Montana got to be some of the best hunters on the planet. <laughs> I go up there and I almost get claustrophobic. Yeah, I can't like, handle it. I need to be able to glass. I yeah. Like to, yeah. I mean, if I went there, if I hunted up there, I don't think I'd carry binos. <laughs> I think I'd hunt with open sights. There you go. And my dad would like it. He could have used his old Marlin 30-30 lever action or something. But no, there's some guys who have remarkable success year after year there in northern Idaho. Yeah. There, and, there are some big deer there. I mean, people right? pull out big deer every year. Yeah. And I just look at that. I'm like, you know what? you guys got to be some badass hunters to do this every year. And then the guys who shoot those big elk up there, you know, they're they're just like gnarly looking prehistoric elk. I don't know. It's got to be the genetics. There's got to be something up there. There there aren't many of them, but boy, they, every once in a while, they get a real smoker that, and some of those guys do it consistently. And, and those of you listening, there's kind of this subculture in Montana, in the West, where there are some serious hardcore hunters who almost act like they don't even hunt. They won't show you pictures on your phone. You're not going to see their pictures on my Hunt Talk website or anything. They are just like as low on the down low as you can get. Because they don't, I don't want anyone following them. They don't want people. Yeah. Why would you post in pictures on spot? if you want someone so, to, they're going to find your spot. Right. Occasionally <laughs> I get to bump into some of them and I know them and I'm like, how was it this year? And you just see the smile on their face. I'm like, oh crap, got another big one. <laughs> but anyhow, that's, uh, I know we're focusing on Montana, but I'm, I'm, I, we're going to get into the other States here because we've been traveling around the West. We, last week we were in Wyoming. Yeah. Uh, Marcus and Tyler were both filming on that trip. And so <laughs> here you go, folks. Wyoming has a point system, right? Deer deadline got moved. It used to be in mid March. Now it's in late May. And so most of your other hunts are probably lined out. You find out if you struck out or whatever, don't have any hunts lined up for the season. Wyoming you can get leftover tags or second choice tags in a lot of units in Wyoming that have really good whitetail hunting. And I'm talking mostly in the North and the Northeast. So 2014, I'm going down to hunt uh, pronghorn and I'm driving through right at daylight, right in the morning through this part of Wyoming. And there are whitetail bucks, like nice ones. I'm like, holy crap, I got a think more about this well then i go shoot my pronghorn i come home a few days later i'm coming back towards evening and there's white tail bucks everywhere i'm like all right i gotta figure this out so uh this last winter i'm on the the go hunt insider and i just uh, kind of thought oh, i'm gonna click wyoming white tail and see what comes up well one of the good white tail areas comes up as this spot i'm driving through i'm like hmm. and i get to looking in the special draw, Wyoming has a regular draw and a special draw. I can get that tag as a second choice. So that's how uh, Matt Seidel from Onyx Maps was with us on that hunt. And there's a reason why Matt was with us. Because when I looked at the surface map of these units where these whitetails are, you're looking at 300 acre pieces, 100 acre pieces. You know, there aren't very many big pieces of public land. They're pretty small little chunks. And I wanted the guy who's like the Charlie Daniels of the of the GPS surface map map <laughs> with us. I mean, by the time we and so Matt and I ended up drawing it as our second choice. So we each gained another deer point in Wyoming, and we went down there and. Through the Onyx map system, Matt had a whole list of places to go and check out. And then they have that walk-in hunting system down there in Wyoming also where you can't drive, you got to walk, but that's the reason there's still some deer on there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And uh, so 
We went down there last week and with a leftover tag, Matt shot a really nice buck. I thought it was, I mean, uh, yeah, for, I for a shot public it. land. <laughs> public land, whitetail's hard. Or yeah. li- unless, I mean, I don't know, yeah. Most places that, that I have ever hunted public land whitetails, it's difficult. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, and Matt shot this really nice whitetail. Um, really tall, four point, well, four by four. When yeah. you're talking white tails, you got, you got to clarify. Uh, and, <laughs> well, that's uh, a, if anyone comes from the east to Montana and says eight point, we immediately know that you're not from Montana yeah, because yeah, that's kind nobody of, calls <laughs> a deer an eight point. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's pretty much uh, across the west. If you come no. and say, yeah, I shot a 10 pointer, uh, it, it, there's nothing wrong with saying that. I mean, having grown up in the Midwest, everything I ever shot, you counted everything you could hang a ring on. And so it might be an 11 pointer, or a 10 pointer, or a three pointer, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. Just know <laughs> that when you come out West, the locals are going to look at you like, we well, know you didn't shoot a 10 pointer. You <laughs> shot a five pointer, five by five. So, uh, but anyhow, Matt, <laughs> Matt shot a very nice, Eight point Eastern count whitetail on public land on this little section of property that he had on his smartphone and said, well, let's go drive up here. And it was, I I was like in panic mode because (laughs) it's my truck. And when it's my truck, everyone's like, oh, you can make it, Randy, you can make it. And Tyler, he's always egging me on, oh, just, just give it enough gas. You'll get through it. And it is so muddy and so much gumbo. My new Nissan Titan only has 17,000 miles on it, but it looks like it's got 117,000 <laughs> miles from that Wyoming trip. And then the next day, uh, just a little piece, not far from maybe what a mile from where Matt Chad is, I had a chance at a nice, not, not, not as nice as Matt's buck, just a, a small, I, I'll just say an average little four point, probably two and a half year old buck. But this leftover public land tag, I'm like, hey, I'll shoot a four by four on that. Um, and when he lined up on these walk in hunting areas, there's a rule that says uh, no shooting within, and they say 100 yards, 200 yards, whatever, of livestock or of buildings. And even though those cows were way back there, I just was like, you know what? I'm not going to shoot. Because if you get some sort of ricochet or some crazy thing and it ricochets back there 300 yards, and even though the cows were off to the right, sometimes, sometimes off to the left, that deer can thank those <laughs> black cows yeah. for the fact that it's still walking around. Otherwise, we would have filled both tags. We only had three days to hunt. Um, and on the last day, I could have could have shot another small buck. But I, I guess when you get to hunt as much as I do, you're not in need for for me where you feel like you gotta shoot a small buck just to say oh i filled my tag but so wyoming is another place idaho is another place idaho where we're at right now most of the hunts are over the counter most of the units here you can hunt over the counter yeah they have a lot of here in idaho they call them controlled hunts and this hunt i'm on is a controlled hunt but it's an unlimited hunt. You're, you're guaranteed to get the tag. You just have to apply that. Oh, okay. Um, so those of you who think, oh, I only got a one-week deer season or a two-week deer season, I, I can give you three states where there's either leftover tags, second-choice tags, 100% draw odds, where you can hunt for months and find lots of deer. So any non-resident can be guaranteed an Idaho mule deer tag, is it? Pretty much. Pretty much? Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. And there's a few places, I think, that are <laughs> all, that the entire unit is a controlled hunt. But they're, most of their general units, they, hmm. uh, not, they, they have non-resident quotas for everything. Oh, okay. But, but they, they haven't filled them for... Gotcha. Eight or 10 years since they, they had a really big price increase here. Okay. Well, now inflation and the other states have kind of caught up to where Idaho had bumped their prices. Um, and actually here in Idaho, if you do one of those uh, just general over-the-counter tags, you can buy two of them. 
to buck tags or two buck tags really wow yeah hmm. the residents can buy a second buck tag but they got to pay the non-resident fee to get the second buck tag hmm. so okay. like one of my buddies who lives here in idaho is just like a predator of the nth degree <laughs> he shot two really nice mule deer bucks this year dang and uh he was able to do it because idaho deer are booming in idaho right now relative to where they were after the hard winters of seven, eight, what was it? Six and seven or seven and eight, 2007 or eight. Anyhow, they had two hard winters there in about the course of four years. And now things are, are way back up to where they could be. So, but, uh, I, I don't see why anyone who wants to hunt deer isn't hunting deer. If you live within driving distance or flying distance of one of these States, there's lots of public land. I mean, where we're here right now, it's, I would say this area is, looks like over half private. Yeah. Just, just no, based on the, on the Onyx maps, yeah. surface stuff. But there's still lots of places to go and there's deer around lots of it. Mm-hmm. Other than that one place we went. Yeah, right? Don't go there. <laughs> uh, but that was part, and some of you have heard me say this in my strategy for how I find elk. Uh, when I know that there's going to be weather patterns that affect them. I usually go really high or I go really low based on where I think they're going to be as a result of weather. Well, it's been a pretty mild winter, so I'm thinking they're going to be up higher, which is why we had to chain up to get up the mountain and everything else because the weather had actually come higher than or more weather than I thought. So then what I do is I drop down really low. And then I start working my way back up the mountain because this is a migratory hunt. And sooner or later, you find kind of where they're at, either through tracks or you see them or whatever else. So, but uh, yeah, I got to come and do Idaho whitetail someday. I, you're the mule deer junkie. Yeah, I guess so. You, you were, (laughs) Marcus and I get a lot of windshield time, so we compare notes about our hunting. Marcus, uh, over 75% of the deer he has shot, the bucks, have been mule deer. And I'm the opposite. In my 25 years, 26 years in Montana, I've had 25 buck tags, filled them all, and I've only shot four mule deer. Yeah. Well, mine was kind of just by default. I mean, because I grew up in southwest Montana and the whitetails all lived on private for the most part. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I got a couple of whitetails on public land and that was a trophy yeah. really oh it is to find one because yeah. especially i mean they're all in the river bottoms and pretty much the whole river bottom yeah i mean where i hunted was all private so. yeah and that that is in some of the places where the whitetails live but you get to western montana whitetails yeah. are in the forest yeah you get to southeast montana you get to northeast wyoming the whitetails are on the forest as much as they are well not as much as they are on the egg ground but there's still plenty of them there let's put it that way northern idaho so much public land and whitetails like crazy so i've never hunted whitetails in idaho i gotta go do it next year i've already tentatively put it on the schedule i'm, I'm gonna try for the whitetail trifecta next year is that a permit or is that something that you're gonna oh, be able to do general general over the counter and it goes until, I think, December 1st. So I'm thinking I need to do a Montana whitetail because I'm going back to southeast Montana. It's, we just, uh, when we're in a boom year like this or cycle like this for deer, I head to eastern Montana. Uh, and I just, I have a soft spot for southeast Montana. When I'm walleye fishing, yeah, it's northeast Montana, far back in that. But, and then I could just hop across the border. Do some South Dakota North, or North Northeast, Dakota? Northeast Montana or uh, Northeast Wyoming. Oh, yeah, that I, border. Okay. Yeah, because I, I can get, that as a second choice. I, I mean, this year there were a ton of them that were even leftovers in those Northeast regions. Hmm. So I'm thinking go over, start in Wyoming, eh, November 8th, 10th, shoot a whitetail there, jump up to Montana, shoot a whitetail there, come home, kiss my wife, jump in the truck, head to Northern Idaho okay. and shoot a whitetail yeah. there. Yeah. 
That'd be cool. That's cool. I mean, but to me, I, even though I did say whitetails were kind of a trophy, there's something about mule deer. Oh, I get you. The I, I just the places they live. I like I like spending time in the places that mule deer live more yeah. than the places whitetail live. No, I, and maybe I, I agree 100. percent I mean that it's kind of interesting though. Some of the places like you're saying in uh, Northwest Montana and in Northern Idaho, yeah. that that's a little more intriguing. Right. That kind of habitat instead of like the mixed agriculture, right? you know, river bottom stuff. It's just, it's a big forest. It's, it's kind of cool. Cause a lot of times mule deer are in the places that are a little more away from people and mm-hmm. from civilization. Right. Not to say that they don't occasionally use some agricultural land as well, but, but just generally speaking. Yeah. Some, I, I don't know. I, I haven't shot a Colorado whitetail. I don't know that I ever will just because the Colorado whitetail thing is pretty, pretty tied up privately. Really? Yeah. yeah. But Kansas, I've shot two Kansas whitetails. Nice. Um, all in their walk-in hunting areas. Cool. Um, so point of all this discussion about deer is don't stay at home in deer season. <laughs> Go deer hunting because there's so dang much hunting opportunity. So when when we were in Wyoming last week, we got on a couple topics, and this is some people are going to slam their fist on the desk or on the dash when they hear us say it one way or the other, and some are going to laugh. But we talked about the one topic of ground solution birds versus oh, yeah. versus what oh, oh, you you try not to shoot at running big game, but you, it's considered ethical to shoot at flush flying, birds. Flying, flying bird. birds, yeah. yeah. Ground and, pounding is frowned upon by right, most bird hunters. Right. And so uh, that's that's the first topic. And and I'm a completely unapologetic. I will stump shoot grouse. I, I, I will. The fact that a grouse doesn't flush is not my problem. <laughs> if he sits there on a stump or mm-hmm. on a trail, I am going to pole axe him every time. Yeah. I'm going to shoot him with an arrow, a slingshot, a shotgun, whatever I can. Yeah. I'll shoot him out of trees. I, I don't care. Yeah. The one, it, the one thing I guess I can understand is, you know, when there's dogs involved, people, that's why you might not shoot at a bird on the ground when, right. if you might have your bird dog ground. But yeah, no, when I, you're I just, you know, elk hunting and you yeah. see a, a grouse, a grouse you, you fly, shoot yeah, them. yeah, shoot it. And Ooh, they're delicious. Like, right. And then you might not get it if you try to flush it before you shoot it. <laughs> like, yeah. And so yeah, then I... You know, then you go to, so it's kind of like everything, it's this spectrum of, well, if that's kind of a slippery slope, or that's a gray area. Well, okay, let's go to pheasants or sharp tail. Yeah. I shoot pheasants on the ground too. Yeah. If you can see them on the ground, that's the tricky part, but yeah. Yeah. I've shot a pheasant on the ground or two. I, I will because I've hit those things in the wing before, and I used to have <laughs> one of the most badass pheasant dogs. It was a, a flushing dog. It was a lab. But he, I mean, he was on that pheasant like a rat on a Cheeto. And still a few would get away. Yeah. Because when those things run, grouse and pheasants are runners. And even some really good dogs can't catch up to them. Oh, yeah. yeah there's... So if I get a chance to shoot one, he's holding tight in the cattails. Or he just barely gets up out of the cattail. I'll just toast him right there. <laughs> I want to eat him. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you. And so then we we were talking about that, and it got to the idea of, well, yeah, why, why is it considered unethical to shoot birds like grouse and pheasants on the ground? But if it, if you no one would ever flush an elk yeah, get or a deer. The, get the elk to run before you start shooting at yeah, it. Yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> so all of you people who are closet ground pounders when it comes to grouse and stuff, <laughs> hey, so shoot me a note, man. I'm, I, let's start a club here. Let's, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I, you don't have to be in the closet about this stuff. I, I'm proud <laughs> to say that I shoot rough grouse, spruce grouse, any grouse on the ground in the tree 
And sometimes, yeah, they flush. They catch me by surprise, and I will shoot them in the air. But I have found that shooting them in the air has far less result than shooting them on the stump. (laughs) Yeah. But I certainly am not going to try to flush a deer because of some sort of ethical belief. Well, right? yeah, I think a lot of people would view that as unethical. I know. Which is it, it's weird. It's it makes an interesting you, makes you wonder thing. How that how that comes to be what it is. Um, anyhow. So so now I have just laid it out there for everyone to criticize me that I wouldn't hunt with that Newberg. That guy'd shoot a grouse, he'd shoot a pheasant off a fence post. <laughs> yep, I would. I've shot sharp tail out of cottonwood trees out of willow trees. I've shot them sitting in stubble fields. Have you ever shot a sharp tail on the ground? Uh, I can't remember. I've shot one with a bow on the ground, but uh, I've shot okay. them out of trees before. Yeah. 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 I've never shot a sage grouse on the ground. I've only shot two of them. So. I've shot those with my bow too. Have you? Okay. I shoot quail on the ground. Anyone who won't shoot a quail on the ground is crazy because those little buggers, <laughs> well, first of all, uh, once you tip one over, you better have a really good dog. That's why I like that when they're all huddled up in a little clutch there. Yeah. Just pick the one with the big curly cue on his head and just polax him right there. There you go. And, and I eat them. You know, that's the other part. When, I, when I'm when i serving rough grouse, just about every time I've taken their heads off. <laughs> You're not going to have BBs all over and bloodshot stuff and feathers in your meat. No, not if I shot them. So, you know, I, we, we kind of got off on a tangent on that. A little bit. But that's all right because it makes people think about the craziness of why we come up. Why do we have certain hunting rules? But we're This morning we are talking about some hunting rule. We are trying to figure out. Oh, the half hour uh, yeah, yeah. thing in Nevada. Yeah, in Nevada you can only hunt until sunset, not a half hour after. Like in every other state I hunt in the West anyhow. Shooting light is half hour before sunrise to a half hour after sunset, mm-hmm. except in Nevada. Yeah. It's a half hour before sunrise until sunset. And so Marcus asked me if I knew why that was. I said, no. I said, it's probably some legislator didn't want people shooting <laughs> during the dinner hour. Yeah. And so he he got the law passed. 77 years ago and no one has ever got around to asking why we're getting it changed which is yeah i think a lot of our cultures customs traditions and even our laws probably have some historical context to them but yeah do you know oh another one i just thought of is the um plug in a shotgun do you know why mm-hmm. that is like you can go hunt sage grouse which you can only shoot two of right and you can have your as many yeah. shells as you want in your shotgun, but if you want to go duck hunting, which you can shoot seven right. or six, depending on where you're at in Montana. Anyway, I'm right. talking Montana here. Yeah. And so, but you can only have three shells in your shotgun. I have no idea why that is. So, uh, yeah. I, right. I don't know if this is like the over under side by side guys saying, Hey, you got those pump and semi auto guys. You got to at least hold them to three shell that, uh, <laughs> I mean, you I know, know, it's funny because I'm actually thankful for it because it has saved me so much ammo over the years. <laughs> like, realistically, how many times you ever hit a duck on the third shot? Like, never. But I, I guarantee I would have taken that fourth and fifth <laughs> shot had I had the chance <laughs> multiple times. Uh, are you one of those waterfall shooters that ammo companies are? Oh are yeah, they love for? me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't hit ducks. I shoot at them, but I don't hit them. <laughs> I don't know why that law is what it is. Maybe somebody does and they can chime in and yeah, and tell us tell us it. why I'm because curious. Yeah, I'm I mean, a lot of people say, well, you know, again, we'll use Montana for an example, but a lot of states have these rules like Idaho you can't use uh mechanical broadheads for archery. Oh, okay, like expandable by right. okay. Right. Yeah. Idaho or in Montana you can't use lighted knocks. Yeah, that one's kind of, so, that's that's just like the blanket electronics on archery equipment is yeah, what that it, falls under, right? Yeah, no, you know, Montana's got a bunch of quirky rules like every state does. And with archery technology, it was changing really fast mm-hmm. about 15, 20 years ago. And 
the commission, the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Commission said, you know what, let's just adopt the Pope and Young regulations. If it's okay. allowed under Pope and Young, we'll allow it. That's what, that's kind of the guidelines they were using for quite a while there. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're still kind of following that policy, but now that Pope and Young just passed that you can use lighted knocks, oh. I wonder if Montana's going to change the lighted knock rule. That'll be interesting, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, you get into muzzle loaders. And I think the intention on the muzzleloader side, a lot of these are like Nevada, it's got to be open sites. Okay. Some states you can't use sabos. Some states you can't use uh, pelletized powder. Um, I think those are just in the spirit of the fact that trying to keep it as primitive weapons. Okay. Yeah. It, that, you it, know, that makes sense to me. Limiting your lethality or, right. or your, maybe that's not the right word, but yeah. No. Yeah. Limiting yeah, yeah. your ability to get. Right. If if they're going to give tags for, let's say, elk in the most vulnerable period of the year, you probably want to have some some restrictions on the hunter that is going to reduce success rates. Yeah. They well, do. depending on what state you're in. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. We can hunt mule deer in the rut I in know. Montana. So right. Well, I don't need to talk about that too much. But. No, it's... <laughs> If there's anything dumber than a two and a half year old meal during the rut, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but anyhow, so I don't know why some of these states have have weird rules. Like some states, if I, when I grew up in Minnesota, opening day of waterfowl season, you had to quit hunting at noon. After that, you could hunt until end of legal shooting light every other day, all the other days. Huh? Opening day, you had to quit at noon. That's interesting. Now, one of the Dakotas, I think it is, pheasant hunting, you can't start till like 10 or 11 in the morning. I'm like, what's up with that? You know, is this like the ag lobby is like, we don't want people out here banging away on shotguns while we're, you know, having our morning breakfast? Or I, I, I don't know. It's some interesting ones for sure. I mean, think of all the states where you can't hunt on Sundays back east. Oh, really? Lots. Know. Huh. Yeah, there's lots of states back east. It's, it's slowly getting changed, but wow. yeah, you can't hunt on that. Sundays. It's, hmm. uh, <laughs> it's well. crazy. So I, I don't know the answer to some of those questions, though. If anyone has answers to them or, or other quirks. Oh, another one that I was curious about was the hanging your tag on your back. Yeah, and the guys in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and stuff like that. Well, because I was the reason we were wondering is because Sika jackets right. have a little tab on the back. And we're like, what is this little tab for? Right. So we looked it up, and yeah. it's so you can hang your tag, right? It's right. Yeah, your like, license on the back. Okay. Yeah, and that's a thing. I didn't realize that yeah. either. I have no idea why those states force you to put that on your back. <laughs> yeah. I. I'm sure some of you are listening from those states and maybe there's a valid reason. Let me know what it is. I, I don't know what it is. It's going to be curious. like an educational podcast for us. Like we're going to get right. everyone to let us know. Hopefully. Yeah. So as you can tell, Marcus and I have spent way too much time driving across the West the last four months uh, asking rhetorical questions and then the other person kind of pondering to see if he can come up with an answer to yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, we could probably like use our phone and like Google it, but you know, that's, yeah. that takes all the fun out of it. Right. No, it's better off to try come up with your <laughs> own ideas about why it is what it is. I, yeah. I don't know. Why is party hunting legal in Minnesota? Oh yeah. I had no idea. That One wasn't... of the few states you, you know, my buddies back there where I grew up, you know, if you're a party of 10, one guy can dump three bucks <laughs> as long as the party is there hunting with them. That's crazy. Yeah. And then, the, you know, in Alaska, you can hunt, what well, they call it a proxy tag. You can have someone hunt as your proxy if you're a resident. Huh. Yeah. It's So there's all kinds of weird things. What, what it points out to me when we, because we travel to all these states and hunt, I sit down every state we hunt and I just worry someday I'm going to get tripped up because I overlook something, but I read their regs and proclamations from front to back. Just, and I make notes, I dog ear the pages of this or that. And it's like, yeah, 
why is this what it is? And, and very often we get comments of, oh, he wasn't wearing hunter orange. Well, Wyoming, you only need an orange hat. And you're, you meet the rule. Yeah. Idaho, you don't need orange. Nevada, you don't need orange. Colorado, Utah, you got to have an orange hat and an orange vest. Arizona and New Mexico, you don't need orange. It's <laughs> it's kind of weird how it, uh, they're just all these different rules and regulations. The moral and, of the story is to make sure you read the regulations <laughs> if you're going yeah. to a state that you don't normally hunt. Right. Do not use the regulations just as a cheap roadmap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, uh, I got to do that because I, as hard as I, you know, I, I want, I, the last thing I would want is to accidentally overlook some, something that's different that I'd never heard of. Mm-hmm. Like when I was hunting in Iowa, 2008, I burned my Iowa points. I now got like eight points again. I was going to pack a deer out if I shot it. Yeah. And I bumped into a game where he's like, well, what do you mean? Pack them out. I'm like, yeah, quarter them up, haul them out. He's like, you can't do that here. I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, no, you can't. You can't uh, quarter them out. You got to bring them out whole. And someone told me that even in the <laughs> northeast states, if you shoot a moose, you got to bring it out whole. <laughs> that's it. well. That's I think in in Alaska, there's some stuff where, or at least you have to leave the bone in. Bone right? in, right? And but I've still. also been told that in <laughs> Pennsylvania, if you shoot a bear, you got to bring it out whole. I mean, imagine if you shot a 500-pound bear. How the heck are you getting that thing out whole? Yeah, I don't know. How, how's that even possible? I mean, it, people get their, like, game carts and, oh, <laughs> oh I shouldn't say how is that possible. I mean, uh, people have their chainsaw winches. And right. They'll make it happen, I guess, but right. it just seems really ridiculous. Yeah. I don't, I, so those rules, why? Yeah. Why, why are they in place? Why can you not quarter up an animal and haul it out on your back? It just, oh well. Well, I mean, and that's like the states that you can't, or well, obviously most places you can do that, but you have to leave evidence, evidence of, sex. of sex. And they all have a different definition of what that is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but. yeah in some states, leaving the head attached is, or, I don't know. I, <laughs> I just by default leave all of the goods, yeah. quote unquote, attached to one hindquarter. Uh, that way I don't got to worry. Yep. And more is better, I guess, in that instance. But holy cow, we're we're getting into some getting funky in the weeds. stuff. I I'm glad we're talking about them though, because I'm hoping that you people listening have answers to some of these questions because I know these are like first world problems we're we're trying to solve here, but yeah. you know, it's it it's just interesting to when you go and hunt you get, you observe observe different hunting traditions and cultures but no matter where i go when something like one of these pop up i want to ask like well why is it this way well and if it's a safety issue i get it mm-hmm. you know some states want you to wear orange i'm sure that's driven by safety some yeah. states you can't use a rifle for turkeys I'm sure that's driven by safety. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's can, a reason you can't use rifles for waterfowl. Yeah. You know, it's driven by safety. I, I get those things. But these other things, it's like, what what the heck? I, I don't get it. But Oh man. So where were we on our, our uh deer hunting travels? Deer hunting travels. Well, we talked about Matt shot that nice buck and Oh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. you and didn't get one, but no, and I came close. Yeah, came close. I just, I don't know. I, um, what it, it was one of those situations where if I don't feel that absolutely I got him, he's dead sort of kind of comfort, I'm not going to pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't quite have it, you know, I'm being distracted by the cattle and then the deers kind of moves a little bit and it's like, man, it's not a, a little bit obscure of the sagebrush or whatever. Oh yeah, that sagebrush, the basin sagebrush in there. Yes, that six was six feet crazy. tall. That's and that's what the whitetails were in. Yeah, that they was were interesting. Bedded in it like corn stalks. Yeah, yeah. It's when people see that episode and they they see that we are shooting whitetails in basin sagebrush, they're going to be like, "What?" 
Yeah. Where the heck was this? <laughs> it's Northeast Wyoming. Well, and you just wouldn't think it. Like you glass it and you're like, oh yeah, I could, you'd pick out deer in there. Yeah. But no, that, well, that stuff, there were some that were 10 feet tall. Yeah. So. And every once in a while you'd see like the, the, the white markings of a deer above the sagebrush. And that's when they got into some of the shorter stuff. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. But from up top, there's no way to like distinguish what was. Yeah. It was, it was really interesting when me and Matt went and did that loop and walked down in there. It was. Yeah. You guys disappeared at times. Yeah. It was a super tall. Yeah. But so when we're done here, if we do get it, then you think we're going to get a deer? Because, oh, we were in, we were in Utah. We didn't podcast from Utah. We did Utah deer oh, earlier that's right. this year. Yeah. Utah archery meal. That was yeah. a. That was a good hunt. That was a really good hunt, but man, low, low deer densities. Yeah. <laughs> we, and we were there a week and we saw, let's see, the first buck I missed was all by himself. There was like a couple does and a smaller buck down below. Yeah. And then the second buck I missed, I I shouldn't be letting the goods out here, but <laughs> I Every arrow I released this year went low, and I don't know what happened, but I'm, uh, I, uh, whatever. <laughs> so that deer had a little buck with him, a little forky horn. Oh, yeah. He kept ruining everything. Yeah. The second buck. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I think that was day five. Five or six. Five or six. Yeah. So in the first six days, we'd encountered two groups of deer that's that's low deer densities and we were putting on miles and we were glassing like crazy yeah but the two bucks we encountered (laughs) were worth it yeah and then that last afternoon we saw that one group of what four or five bucks oh yeah that's right there weren't any never like lunkers in there but no they were so yeah that was uh it was a fun hunt in a lot it of ways. It was really interesting to me. It's yeah. like putting that much time into glassing. I mean, because you could see so right. much. Yeah. It and was, it wasn't like it was super thick. Nope. There, I mean, there was some trees and stuff, but like yeah. you could glass so much of it and you yeah. know you would see deer if they were there and they just were not there. Right. Yeah, that was hey, that just, it's one huge big rock pile for I don't know. I'm guessing it's ten eight miles wide and fifteen twenty miles north to south, and uh, huge fire, a lot of burn area, but a couple couple traits of where we did locate the deer. You could not get an ATV to any of those places. No, and there were a lot of ATV trails in other places. And there were little seeps of water. Yeah. If I had that tag again, I'd take my map and I'd say, all right, where is it physically impossible to get an ATV? Those two places were two of them. Yeah. And those are the places I'd look. Mm -hmm. Because every place else had ATVs and Mm -hmm. their stuff racing around. And boy, those were nice bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It can, you could easily get discouraged in that unit though. Oh, Cause even yeah. that other place we went, there was, <laughs> yeah. there was water, no ATVs, right? but also no deer. We never <laughs> saw a deer. Like, we saw that one group of elk, that one spot we hiked up way into. in there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we've, but, this year we've been, let's see, we've hunted deer in Utah, Nevada. Now we're in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. And then we got... Arizona. Oh yeah. Arizona. Yeah. Oh, Arizona. Yeah. In January, I already have the Havelina tag. So I'm going down to Arizona. A lot of you don't know this, but you should that starting like in early December, right about now and running into pretty, pretty much a lot of January, Arizona has over the counter archery deer tags for a lot of the units. You got to look at the regulations and see which ones, but and a lot of them are for mule deer, and a lot of them are for mule deer or whitetails, i.e. cows deer. Everyone calls them coos, but technically it's pronounced cows. Oh, really? We'll call it coos just because that's the but... most popular way that most people pronounce okay. it. But yeah, we'll be down there in January. I mean, I looked at the success rates, Marcus. 
<laughs> this is this is like so fatalistic to even look at the success rates down there for the archery coos deer oh, in yeah. these areas. The success rates, the sometimes when you look at it's a bar graph, yeah, you can hardly even distinguish that it rises above the zero line. <laughs> so, so there was nobody that was successful yeah, in some years. Like, oh my goodness. Why am I doing this? Huh. But the reason I'm doing it is because one, it's an opportunity that I've always wanted to do. I I'm already buying the, the Arizona hunting license mm-hmm. for, a, for my applications for elk and, and everything else, antelope and bighorn sheep and, and the limited entry deer. I got the license may as well go do something and and yeah. so i bought a javelina tag i applied for an archery javelina tag and those are like 100 percent draw odds so i'm going to be down there i've got a hunting license and i'm going to be me and wade and jerry are going to be hunting Mern's quail scaled quail gambles quail and then we're going to try to arrow i am anyhow they're they're going to keep hunting quail and they're <laughs> going to send me out to try arrow either a mule deer or a coos deer and fill my javelina tag. I mean, I don't know. That's like seven days of just absolute pure fun. And there's so much public land down there. Arizona's got tons and tons of public land. Yeah. So that's, yeah. We're So what states were, will we miss this year? Colorado and New Mexico of the Western states. For deer. Yeah. Those will be the only states we don't hunt deer in this year. Of the core. Right. Yeah. Western hunting states. Yeah. And of all those Western Rocky Mountain states, the only two that were hard to draw tags were Utah and Nevada. Mm -hmm. Everything else was a general or over the counter or leftover tag. Nice. Point being, if you want to hunt deer... (laughs) There's no reason you're not hunting deer other than you decided you aren't going to come and hunt deer. There's a well. reason deer are called America's game. <laughs> and everybody wants to say whitetails are America's deer. And I get that. But it could be in any kind of deer. It doesn't doesn't matter. Um, all right. Or one other uh, conundrum, quandary, ethical dilemma point. And this one's a little more practical, I think. Shooting does versus shooting small bucks, young bucks. Okay. I and it came up in Wyoming. Of that whitetail tag was an either sex tag, mm-hmm. and I could have shot a multitude of does. I mean, how many times did we have a doe within two hundred yards of us that I could have shot? Mm-hmm. And then you see these younger bucks, and it's like. Well, I could shoot one of those too. And and personally, I would shoot a doe before I'd shoot a year and a half old buck. And I don't mind if other people shoot a year mm-hmm. and a half old buck. But I'm always you know, kind of in my mind, I'm, I'd never ask someone the question, but in my mind, I'm like, I wonder why they preferred to shoot a year and a half old buck. Well, versus I mean, a doe. I think in a lot of areas, it's encouraged to shoot the bucks over the does right. because obviously one buck can breed multiple does. Right. So you don't need that high of right. buck to doe ratio to, you know, to make it work. But at some point, you, I think in some areas, people are probably driving the ratio to be on, you know, out of balance, out yeah. of balance, unhealthy, however you want to look at it. I mean, in the, there's a ton of debate and studies on this. Yeah. And, it's, and for those of you who don't know, Marcus has a degree in fish and wildlife management. So, But that doesn't really mean I know anything. It just means, <laughs> it means I spent four years somewhat learning about some so, things. So but it, I, I know it's just an undergraduate degree. I didn't right. get my master's or anything like that. So. Right. So I don't, I don't really know anything, but it's always helpful to be able to look over and say, Hey Marcus, 
why is it this way? What, what's the deal with these animals or this study or this situation? And you just say, I don't know. Let me look it up. Yeah. <laughs> he gets out his phone and Googles it. <laughs> no. That's what, they, that's what they teach you to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, it was just one of those things we were talking about of when faced with the situation, would I prefer to shoot a doe or would I prefer to shoot a young buck mm-hmm. if, and there were you know before i started the tv show or before I, I shouldn't say that before i started hunting multiple states i would shoot my montana deer mm-hmm. and it was kind of yeah and that was me that i carried me through the year and i know not a lot of states are well some state let's just well, montana you usually get a couple extra doe tags not every state's that way so I've kind of got myself into this mindset that if the game managers think that the does can sustain the harvest, I'll shoot a doe before I'll shoot a young buck. Mm-hmm. Just because, all right, he's made it a year and a half. If he can make it to two and a half, he's got the chance. Because I think most of these deer are uh, pretty... Uh, well, they're pretty vulnerable in that first year and a half, too. So if they get through the tube of that, I just feel like, you know what? He's earned the right to be able to <laughs> to uh, to make it further. So I don't know. I'm sure people listen. Well, I think it, it depends, you know, on every unit and every, every state, every unit's going to be different. And the managers, the biologists that are looking into what, they would prefer to be harvested is, I mean, it's different in every scenario. Right. And unfortunately politics and stuff comes into play as well and that kind of things, but uh, social pressures are definitely part of it. So deer versus elk. Deer versus elk. You rather hunt deer or elk? Would I rather hunt deer or elk? Yeah. Elk. Elk. Okay. (laughs) I would say that's the case for me too, but I really love deer hunting. Yeah. And well, here comes another train. Yeah. Um, a big part of why I love deer hunting is I think if I took my most strenuous deer hunt, it's never been as bad as my easiest bull elk hunt. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you start to factor in the extraction. Right. That's what, I, that's what I'm talking about. The extraction, the just the places they'll drag you and take you and make you go. Yeah. Um, so after we've done our share of elk hunts in the fall, for me, I start looking forward to these deer hunts because they're a little more relaxing. Yeah. They're just, you know, you, you, you don't feel a lot of pressure. You, physically, your body's kind of wore out from elk hunting. You get the benefit of not having to hike 10, 12 miles a day. <laughs> If you shoot one, the first thought in your mind is not, how am I going to get this thing out of here? <laughs> it's like, oh, cool. You know, it's, so I don't know. I, I'm with you. I, uh, yeah, I, I'd rather hunt elk. It's, but at my age and my, my health, I'm starting to wonder if uh, the, the deer are going to start climbing up that priority scale and the elk are going to stop or start sliding pretty soon. Mm-hmm. I'm just getting to the point like, this is, this elk stuff is just you way. Just, you should just give up the public land gig and just go <laughs> out onto the pivots. <laughs> just find a, you know, find a nice rancher who oh. just needs you to take, take some elk off his pivot for him. And just, and you just yeah. have him bring the tractor around, load it up. There you go. Get him out. Whole. You just have to change your <laughs> methods of elk hunting a little bit. There you go. Yeah. I, uh, well, remember when we were hunting with Corey in New Mexico? Oh, yeah. And I talked to Corey the other day, and I told him he still owes me a podcast. So those of you who are waiting for me and Corey to podcast about New Mexico, uh, I apologize, but the ball's in his court. So, But remember, he kept joking when it was because it was hard to find elk. He's like, all right, 
We're showing everybody how hard it can be on public land. What do you say next year? We go and show them how easy it could be on some big private estate. And I'm like, yeah, Corey, that'd go over really good with our crowd. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he was joking when he said it, folks. So <laughs> don't don't call Corey or email him and say, what are you talking about? No, I... Uh, just put that film permit money towards a trespass fee. Just go. <laughs> we can just go out sipping coffee, looking out oh. the glass and out the window. There you go. Get up at 10 in the morning and be back for lunch. Yeah. I, I, gosh. <laughs> I don't know, Marcus. You're making this sound pretty good. What Marcus was referring to when he said film permit fees, some of you heard, well, you've heard us mention it in other podcasts, is we got to pay for BLM and Forest Service film permits. Um, and over the course of a season that costs us about, oh, 12 to $16,000 a year to film this TV show just as public land film permits. So Marcus was just joking and yes, he was smiling and <laughs> laughing as he said it, that we should take that money and go buy one of these big exclusive shoot them out in the cornfield kind of alpha alpha elk hunts. But uh, yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, I love I love hunting on public land. Yeah. It's, there's something special Marcus about hunting is, on, on public land. Yeah. And, you know. There is. Wild places. Yeah. You are, you, that's pretty much all you do also, Marcus. So yeah. I, Occasionally I'll go, my grandpa has some land, but yeah. go shoot a deer there, but that's about it as far yeah. as private. Yeah. Marcus and his wife both shot public land elk the first weekend of the season with their bows this year. That's, that's, a, that's a serious accomplishment, Marcus. Yeah. Kara got her bull or well, she had a cow. She got, she shot her cow within the first five hours of hunting. Yeah. That was pretty, pretty wild. That is so cool. That, that is just so cool. We got to have Kara on the podcast. She's a, what is she? What's her master's in food systems? In sustainable food systems. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we need to have her talk about how sustainable the the uh, hunting food system is. She'd probably say, I don't know. Let me look that up for you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's the default answer. For she us. can speak a lot better to some vet, you know, kind of the vegetable scene, the, the, the local food scene. Okay. In terms of, but that, it would be interesting to, you know, contrast that I think, with hunting. I think it would be really interesting to understand because Shane Mahoney's doing a a big thing called the Wild Harvest Initiative. Yeah. And in that he's measuring how much protein hunters and anglers harvest in North America and then how much they share it and what it would take to replicate and produce that. What it means economically, culturally, socially, and just health wise. Because to go and produce that quality of protein at that scale would be very, very challenging. Yeah. No, that's it is really interesting because I I've heard him talk about that too, and yeah, I'm I'm curious to see kind of I mean yeah, Shane's been on the podcast I think three times, four times, and uh, he uh, he he's making progress on it, and if anyone can pull it off, it'll be him. But I. Uh, I don't know. It just, I think it's useful information, but just in my own self-serving mind, I'd like to know more about how sustainable a food system is that relies upon a natural harvest. Yeah. I, I'm not smart enough to figure that out, and I'm not good at looking it up. I'm, I'm not a Google. Well, I think, I'm I think. I'm not good at it. I mean, just, just looking at it non-scientifically, seems to be pretty sustainable the north american model that yeah. we got going on is mm -hmm. is something special for right. sure like that yeah and uh, if that model were to ever collapse and that sustainability of it collapsed my household food budget would go through the roof <laughs> i'd probably get fatter I'd probably grow all kinds of lumps and warts and bumps and <laughs> uh gosh can you imagine if you had to eat store-bought chicken every day? Oh, yeah. No, that's... Never it's, have, so... No. Oh, I, I mean, I, I don't, like, turn down food from other people, but I always grew up eating wild game. Yeah. That's what we always had. Yeah, yeah. If 
The odds are at my house, if it's some sort of protein on the table, it's been shot or caught by one of the people sitting there. Yeah. And not in all instances, but in most instances. And uh, it's fun to have guests over who get to share in that. And there's always a story with it. There's always the, not maybe just the story of uh, that specific animal, but there's always the long told spinning yarns of, oh yeah, back in 1978, you know, I shot my first deer, caught my first blah, blah, blah. It's, I don't know there's, if that ever goes away, just stick me in a plot somewhere and shovel the dirt over me. <laughs> I really, that's, uh, that's kind of how I feel. I, yeah. I know my wife would say, well, what, I don't matter. I, I don't mean that at all, but, uh, you know, my, my interest in life is about doing what we do here. And, yeah. And all the side benefits and byproducts that the good, I mean, so many good ones come of it. The food being primary. Yeah. I got to figure out how to eat these muskrats and beaver. I'm going to trap this winter though. Yeah. I'll, I'll, we can try some stuff cause I ate one muskrat and the legs were not good, but I feel like that if we mess around with it, get the pressure cooker out. We'll with the back straps? The back straps are good. Yeah. I but, but I think if, yeah, pressure cook, maybe some crock pot action, make make those legs worthwhile somehow. I think what we need to do is Hank Shaw was on the podcast. Yeah. We need to bring Hank up when I start doing this trapping. And That'd be cool. We'll, we'll get a beaver. Because uh, two years ago, I didn't trap last year just because I was busy as doing shows on the road and everything in about two or three weeks i caught 300 muskrats two raccoons and 16 beaver nice how you can eat 300 muskrats two oh, raccoons have and 16 beaver big old party <laughs> have everyone bring their crock pot <laughs> bring your own crock pot what, have what a muskrat it? cook off <laughs> figured it out <laughs> you know we had jonathan uh odell, John odell yeah yeah from arizona game and fish he was talking about the squirrel uh squirrel cook-off squirrel cook-off i wonder if we can convince him to come up and join us for a muskrat cook-off first annual muskrat cook-off bozeman oh, montana there we go 2017 the, the gallatin valley scrap <laughs> fest in canada muskrats are commonly referred to as scrats yeah. Uh, not muskrats, scrats. The Gallatin Valley Scrat Fest, Bozeman, Montana. There we go. Huh. No, I'm, I'm we're because we're gonna do a bunch of YouTube videos about. And the the premise of the YouTube videos is one, just trapping is is a good outdoor skill to have. For me, when I wanted to build relationships with people and landowners for my CPA business uh, and for places I wanted to waterfall hunt or fish or whatever. If you tell these ranchers, these farmers or these landowners, or even if they aren't ag producers, Hey, I'll take care of that beaver headache for you. You make a lot of friends in a hurry. <laughs> I mean, it, when it's March and it's calving season and their pastures flooded by a beaver. Yeah. They don't like that beaver. I can imagine. <laughs> so I, uh, we're going to do that, um, show people how we do it. Um, but I think we're going to have to ask, at least try eating some of them. Yeah. You, you said the backstrap. You them. said the, mac, the backstraps on the muskrat were okay? Yeah. I haven't had a backstrap that hasn't been okay on any animal that I've tried. I've tried some weird, some I weird mean, critters. I mean, like a backstrap on a muskrat. No, it's is, not much. Yeah, I was gonna say it's not even as big around as my pinky. That's just like a little, yeah, little I, sliver of meat. But right, that's why you got to figure out how to make the legs worthwhile too. So yeah, because that's mostly what they are. That's mostly what it is. But a muskrat gets green belly. You know that bacteria that is in their stomach. Oh, really? Yeah. If you leave them for very long, that bacteria creates so much heat that they get what's called green belly, where, where the belly and the hide and everything will get like green, green, like They're probably not I eat. Irish beer green. I have yeah. to Google that. <laughs> yeah. No. If you type in muskrat green belly, it'll, I'm like, why do these things turn green? I don't care how cold it is. If you lay them on their stomach after you've trapped them and they've, they say they were alive in the trap. Mm -hmm. 
they will turn green in hmm. the stomach. So that's why I try to set traps where muskrat gets in the trap, he goes out in the current, and he drowns within a minute. Then you don't get green belly. But yeah, we'll there probably you. get some email responses. Someone don't eat muskrats; you're gonna get <laughs> sick. Yeah. Well, uh, you know when when we did that wolf hunt, uh, Steve Ranella, who does the meat eater show and podcast. He, he'll eat anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, Steve had sent me a message or talked to me. I can't remember how it came up. But anyhow, uh, he, he told me if we shot a wolf, he wanted to eat it mm-hmm. and that we'd cook it up. And uh, so I shot it. I, mean, I didn't shoot it. Matt Clyde shot it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we took it in to get it tagged and everything else. And uh, the gal, Julie, who was checking it in said, well, w- w- what are you guys going to do with this? I said, oh, I'm going to eat them. And she's like, whoa, 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 what do you mean you're going to eat it? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. She's like, she, she rattled off a whole, she's done a lot of wolf research. She mm-hmm. used to be a coordinator for the state federal program. I didn't know that. She's like, well, do you know about this and this and this and this and this? I'm like, well, can't you cook it out of them? And she's like, Randy, I, I get it. I, I understand you're wanting to utilize this to the fullest extent, but my professional opinion is you're taking a serious risk. Hmm. So we ended up not eating that wolf. And so Steve hears we shot the wolf. He either emailed me or texted me or whatever and said, like, what'd you do that? I'm like, and so I told him what happened. He's like, no, we could have cooked that out of there. Let's cook it to 160. It'll be good. Yeah. I'm- so I, I still feel like I owe Renella a, a wolf. Well, let's and, go find uh, one. And we'll eat it. Okay. I'll, I'll cook that thing too. Yeah. I'm happy and to. uh, the, the two years ago when I caught all those beaver, Giannis Brutellas, who is with the meat eater crew, I think I brought three of those beaver over to him. Oh, really? Yeah. He was just loving them. Cool. So I wonder if they're better. Well, in I think the sh- they eat the tail too or something I've heard. Oh, a something. lot of people do. I never have. Hmm. I, I don't know. If we eat beaver, I'm not eating the tail. I'll leave that Seems up to you. Like it'll be, I don't know. I wonder if you got to trim all that oily fat off them. I mean, a beaver carcass has a lot of oily fat on it. Really? Yeah. I wonder if you got to render it like bear fat and boil it off or something. But, I'm sure there's, there's uh, got it. People have had to eat beaver. That's a lot of, that's a big oh, chunk of meat. Oh, yeah. I mean, beaver is a very common food source in Canada and yeah, okay. Alaska. I mean, a lot of people in northern Minnesota where I grew up would eat beaver. I never, I, I did one time, I take that back, Ed Bowes made beaver and uh, I ate it. I thought it was okay. Hmm. But, so we can, we got all kinds of YouTube stuff we can do this winter when I hit the trap line. All right. So there you've heard it, folks. Marcus is going to crock pot a whole whole box full of muskrat thighs. <laughs> yep. You know another well, guy? Let's make pulled muskrat. I mean, if you just like, yeah. they can't go wrong if you just pull it, all the meat apart and throw barbecue sauce in there. I mean, I haven't met a meat that you can't do that with. Really? So that's huh. like the can, worst case scenario. Can you camouflage it and tell people it's like pulled oh, pork? Oh, yeah. This one, yeah, it's pulled pork. I'll eat it. <laughs> Done it with pigeons and <laughs> all Can sorts you of imagine stuff. if you had a bunch of people over who were a little bit on the squeamish side about outdoor stuff and tell them it was pulled pork and then when they're all done it's like, Yeah, those are muskrats we caught out in the swamp the other day. Or coots, we've done it with coots. Uh, yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. It worked? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> well, as you folks are learning, Marcus will eat anything. Pretty um, much. There, there's times we're driving down the road and there's a dead animal laying there and he looks at me like, almost like he wants me to stop. <laughs> Maybe pick that up and, and you know, let's, uh, let's try and make that into food. Uh, but uh, how'd we get on that topic? I don't know. We've been kind of going on some tangents. Yeah. Well, other YouTube things we've done. We, we just, let's see. We posted up the the European mount for the elk. Yep. We just posted that up, how to do it. And before all of you email me, there are a thousand, a hundred different ways <laughs> to do it. Yeah. Marcus has done a lot of them. I've done a lot of them. When I'm on the road, I usually have to hire somebody to do them because I just, you know, when you 
take the hide off the head and you want to do a European mount, I can't leave that laying in my wife's garage for three months until I get home. It'll be a little on the rank side. So I end up having to hire a lot of them done, but we had a week long break there. And so we did the YouTube video on that. And there's all kinds of other little tricks we could have thrown in there. We didn't have time to run to a car wash where there's a high pressure power washer or, yeah. or I don't have one. I often borrow my neighbors or my friends. I think that was the number one comment that people are like, why aren't you using a pressure washer? Right. Like, well, so not we, everybody has a pressure washer. Right. So we <laughs> used my garden hose thinking, all right, pretty much everybody has a garden hose. Yeah. And uh, so it turned out great. I, I mean, the, the video turned out good, but but the Euro mount turned out great. Mm-hmm. So now we got to show people how you, someone wants to, someone, a couple of people ask, well, how do you hang them up in your shop or how do you hang them on the wall or whatever? So maybe we'll do that. I don't know. If you can't figure out how to hang one up, mm, <laughs> I, I don't know that you know how to turn on the computer and watch a YouTube video. I shouldn't say that, but that just seems pretty elementary. And then we did one about how to quickly pop out the ivories yep. of an elk. Um, I'm sure most of you know that the elk have these, aren't they the remnants of some fang or something? I was told See, this is one time. of those things that I should know, but I'd have to Google. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going with what I've been told. And then this, you know, at my, at your generation, you say, well, I Googled it. Yeah. My generation says, you know, I heard one time. <laughs> that, that's how, that's, that's how we say, it. I heard more than one time that elk ivories are remnants from back when they had fangs. Yeah. So. I think, I think it is a, what is it? Remnant or vis, vestigial? Is that the right word? Some, so, yeah, yeah, it's a, an old thing that's not actually practical for anything they do now, right. but at some point in the past it had a purpose probably. Yeah. And, uh, so we showed you guys how to pop those out real quickly. Um, even if you're out in the field, pop them out, take them home, polish them up. I'm one to talk. I got a whole bag full of them sitting there in my drawer at, in my shop and I haven't done, haven't polished up any of them. Some of them got yeah. gunk and tissue and dried goobers and other stuff on them. But so we've done those ones. Um, in Nevada, Mike Spitzer helped us do those European mounts yeah, I gotta down there. Edit up that video next, yeah. hopefully. So that one will be up. That'll be how to do a Euro mount on a deer. It's pretty much the same exact thing. I, Except I guess we could add with the from the field aspect. Not right. that it's any different, yeah. but right. Just uh, so you you're able to take all this stuff with you if you want to do it. Yeah. From your deer camp. Yeah, and then when we were in southeast Montana. Uh, my buddy Dick Ferguson, who shot the mule deer there, he's also a taxidermist. So he, uh, we shot a YouTube video of him caping a deer because a lot of times you might be somewhere where that cape it's so warm that it'll if you don't get it caped off and get the cape on ice or in a cooler somewhere, the hair will start slipping on it. So mm-hmm. the idea was to show people how to do it on a deer same exact process and procedure on an elk and then he actually has this uh portable sawzall and so Hmm. he also showed where to make the cuts and how to do the skull cap for the taxidermist okay so uh those will be two more videos that are coming up on our youtube channel pretty soon Um, and then that you know we posted that one video about give us your comments Oh, Tell yeah. Us what you I need see. to go back and read through those again, too. Oh, my goodness. I was going through them the other day because we then shared that on Instagram and Facebook. And, man, <laughs> people want to see a lot of stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of things that won't quite be possible. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and a lot of it, I'm like, I have no practical background to exp- to provide some of it. I mean, yeah, I've done it before, but there's like a million other YouTube videos that show you professionals doing it mm-hmm. so i know it. this winter we're gonna start sorting through them and uh doing it and uh oh and then before we we get done marcus has it we, we get off the road let's see in about three days you'll be home for a month mm-hmm. and i gotta go i got trade shows but you'll be home uh 
in the last podcast, we made a request for Wilderness Production Assistance, WPAs. And an awful lot of people must listen to this podcast because I have been inundated with emails of people offering to be a WPA. In fact, if we took every one of the submissions we have and say we do 12 hunts a year, I bet you we could have six or seven WPAs on each trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think... <laughs> What people maybe didn't understand is WPA doesn't mean that you get to just go hang out for four days. Right. And that's it. Right. <laughs> maybe maybe you should clarify a little right. bit we, what, what you're looking for. Right. We're looking for somebody who has some camera skills, um, has very strong back, is in good shape, can operate at you know, in the mountains, the steep country, high elevations, can uh, live out of a tent for long periods of time without having to shower and not having to call home to mama every you know two hours and it, it's going to be hard work it's going to be packing a lot of gear it's going to be doing whatever marcus or i need done to get the shot or to get set up or to whatever um and you're going to be taking a lot of still images while we're doing our thing. We want you to take images of us, images of our, of our gear, of our sponsors. We want you to take, I mean, and we'll hand you the cameras and say, here, play with it because it's all digital. So if we look at it and it's like, no, that doesn't work. We can just delete it. Um, all those kind of things, right? Yeah. I mean, well, are you looking for someone who, are you wanting someone to just be able to do one hunt or are you wanting like oh, yeah, that's someone the for thing. the whole season? Cause yeah, it's, it's not <laughs> practical for us to bring a different person on every hunt because there's so much familiarization showing the ropes kind of thing. Yeah. So. And not to like, you know, be mean or anything, but right. sometimes right. people aren't cut out and then if it's someone who's not cut out, that kind of drags down the whole right. operation. Yeah. And so Marcus is going to get to go through all of these emails that you guys have so kindly and enthusiastically <laughs> sent us. And there's some really good ones. I mean, one I've been kind of scanning them as they come in. There are some people who are like super qualified. Really? Nice. Yeah. So I'm going to have to figure out what they want for pay. Well, some of them weren't. Some of them saying they wanted to take vacation. They were yeah. just like they have high paying jobs. And some, they wanna... of you, some of you guys, I love it, man. You really want to, you're dedicated. A bunch of these people said, "No, I don't want to be paid. Just pay my travel expense. I just I'll come and be your Sherpa for a week." I'm like, no way, I'm not doing that. I, you know, the people's vacation time and away from their families way too important to. Invest it and just. Well, if you're gonna do that, you should. You if you're if you feel that strongly about doing something like that, you should go on your own hunt. Yeah, like right. That would be exactly. That would be more rewarding. Yeah. More better use of their time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no, when when we decide this, so we're looking for 2017, and yes, it will be a paid position. Um, it will. You'll be covered with workers' comp and everything else, and. We pay all the expenses. We provide all the equipment. You just show up and work hard and be smart and smile. Even when Randy's kind of being a whiner and a sniveler, just smile and say, it'd be like Marcus. Marcus is like the most optimistic guy around. And uh, uh, it's working. <laughs> this year, he's like, oh, yeah, we'll shoot one tomorrow. Guaranteed. Sure enough, we shoot one. And Hopefully, whoever is this WPA guy, we uh, he's he's got that same optimism that that positive idea that yeah, next hour, next day, yeah. just just around the corner. You don't want to doubt yourself and <laughs> thinking negative is going to produce negative uh, results. Yeah. Well, I I will say that even though our work is hard, I don't know that. It's 
it's it's got its moments of intensity, but I don't know that it's quote unquote stressful. Do you yeah. feel that it's stressful? No, not most of the time. I mean, yeah. obviously, like in the moment of a of a shot or a right. stock or something, right. you you're or at least I get my heart thumping and yeah. like when that bull came in uh, in New Mexico with Corey Jacobson. Yeah. I was shaking. I couldn't stop really? shaking. Which one? Because that was when the my backpack was squeaking. I was like shaking. And like, <laughs> oh, it was, okay. it was the bull you were sitting back calling. It was uh, the only one of the only bulls that we got to come in, and it came in. Oh yeah, but it was oh. as obstructed by all the trees and right, stuff. Right, that's right. Yeah, I, I didn't ever get very good day. footage of it, so I don't even I, know. If I, I am so know. glad that you guys didn't shoot that bull. Yeah, what? we were at seven, seven, seven and a half miles, or from, seven miles in, something like that. Yeah, yeah. from. <laughs> from the Yamaha Viking, yeah. And then once we got back to that, it's like a god awful road for two, three hours, two and yeah. a half hours, something. Yeah. Like that. I uh, when when <laughs> Corey came back and looked exasperated, like oh he just slipped through our fingers because it was so thick where I was set up calling and where Ben was with me, we couldn't see anything. We could hear him. Mm-hmm. I, I just looked down at my GPS. As you guys were coming back, I'm like, oh, I hope he didn't kill that thing. <laughs> and then when I saw the look on Corey's face, I'm like, Phew, don't got to pack that thing out for seven miles. <laughs> yeah. But that was one of those moments where I was like, because I was shaking and I couldn't stop shaking. Hmm. And like my backpack was making noise and Corey's like looking at me and I'm like, I, I can't stop it. I don't know. How, I, I'm shaking. I can't. I don't know what to do. And the bull's just like, you know, 25. I don't know how far he was. He was within archery range. Oh. It's like. Was it a decent bull? Yeah, it was a nice bull. I mean, okay. we got we got footage of it running yeah. away, unfortunately. Okay. Not, huh. not when it came in. I mean, the camera's pointed that direction, but you can't really make it out. There's so much brush. Oh, it was so thick there mm-hmm. in that spot. Yeah. Hmm. So that was not stressful but intense intense yeah yeah it's like the moment but no like yeah i mean yeah i don't think you're no the only the only time it gets stressful working on our outfit is if you're late (laughs) i if you can't get the mattress off your back in the morning do not bother coming with me (laughs) because my theory in life is if i say we're rolling at six o'clock and you show up at six o'clock you're already about 10 minutes late (laughs) so that's just how i operate and my wife knows that if i'm late because of somebody i'm just like not happy for about an hour i don't know why that is I don't know why I have to be that way, but <laughs> anyhow, if you're a WPA applicant and you really have a trouble, a hard time getting up in the morning, then just kindly let us know that you'd like your name withdrawn. <laughs> That's the only time I think things get stressful around our our outfit. Yeah. Other than that, it's just, I mean, what's to be stressed about? being out on America's great public lands, telling the story of the public land hunter. If you get stressed over that, you better just put a fork in it. (laughs) Yeah. What else we got, Marcus? I don't know. To be continued? I guess so. Got to go kill a deer tomorrow. It's supposed to be five degrees in the morning. Yeah. Should we eat breakfast before we go? Or should Uh, should we just do our normal, get a coffee and run? Yeah, probably. I don't know. Is anywhere even going to be open? I mean, we'd I have to know. probably not. go to a grocery store tonight or something. Good stuff. Yeah, probably not. But, All right. That was a really good donut, a frosted donut I had this morning. Go uh, to the gas station, get a donut. Yeah, that yeah. was brand, uh, that, you could tell that was made this morning. Where it wasn't get, like no, some gross, wasn't. crusty thing that's been sitting out for a couple of oh, days. Oh, no. I, I should have bought two. Oh, nice. I, I, I have a couple problems in life, folks, with foods. Uh, uh, chocolate, Dairy Queen, and maple bars. If there is a maple bar, I'm like a connoisseur of maple bars. Mm -hmm. And I could look at that gas station there. I'm like, these are homemade. This this isn't like some sort of brought it in on the Schwann's truck sort of thing. (laughs) These are homemade. Stuck my head in the cabinet there and gave it a good sniff. I can't believe I didn't buy two of them. (laughs) 
<laughs> Tomorrow I'm buying two. All right. Because if it's going to be five degrees, I wonder how many calories you burn off hiking six or seven miles in five degree weather up and down the mountain. Yeah, I don't know. Probably enough that you could eat a second maple bar. <laughs> Uh, well anyhow we'll, we'll uh hopefully have a story to tell but yeah. what if we don't have any encounters on this hunt yeah and it doesn't know. make tv it doesn't make youtube because it's just a dud then our next podcast we've kind of set ourselves up that the next mm -hmm. podcast the audience is going to be like well randy what happened in idaho well we kind of had an encounter today it was i mean if we were rifle hunting it would have counted oh, as well, an encounter yeah. like 300 yards yeah. But it was a little... Yeah, he's not, a nice Not buck. quite. I don't think you even took your bow off your backpack, so... I didn't because... <laughs> so here's the deal. We're on one mountain. We see these deer across the valley from us. That's a little drainage. And they start moving southwest. We drop off the face of this ridge, run down to the truck, drive down to the next little canyon. We start hiking up the canyon thinking we'll intercept them. And... They must have been on a serious route. I mean, they, they were moving out because I did not think they would get in front of us before we got there. Yeah, I don't know. Because, well, then the one buck met up with, with the other buck one, that other one at. that was already there. Right. So I don't know what if that one buck was just cruising. I don't know. It's hard to know. I wonder if those does, those does might have already been there. Yeah. They might it, not have been with. Or anyhow, he might not it, been, we yeah, didn't get work. there in time. We were about, I don't know, another t 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we would have been up on that ridge. And yeah, it would have been perfect timing if right. we. Yeah, if they were, we knew the line they were taking. Mm -hmm. We just, they got there before we could get there. Mm -hmm. Which, considering that we're running up, slopes in six eight inches of slippery snow i guess <laughs> i guess we can't be too hard on ourselves but so we had that encounter that's a nice buck yeah i mean i just shot him with a rifle yeah and then that funky two point so folks if you guys if if this happened and i shoot a we just got on this discussion about shooting two points there's a two point running around down here that is like really massive and tall yeah, he's he's nice. not super wide. I would shoot that two pointer. Yeah. He's a cool looking buck. Mm hmm. I don't think he's a year and a half old buck. No, he's. I think he's like three and a half. Yeah, he's something. at least three and a half. So I, I, I would. I got a problem with big two point mule deer. <laughs> I, I just. that That's one of the things in life I want to shoot is a monster forky someday. Yeah. Or a monster three point. But you almost had it this year, but I know uh, that, that fourth point really screwed you up. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Dang. But so, yeah, I guess we've already had an encounter, but you can't have a TV episode with just, yeah. just one 300 yard encounter when you're bow hunting. No. Yeah. There's, well, so we'll get some exciting content tomorrow. I hope so. We got tomorrow, the next day and part of the following day. So anyhow folks we'll uh we'll give you the update about what happens in southeast idaho in this first week of december um that'll be on the next podcast i guess if we get a chance to do it because i uh you go home and then i gotta go to trade show so we might not get it might be two podcasts from now before marcus and i can get caught up and okay. sit down and tell the big whopping story about the longer forky that got shot in yeah. the southeast Idaho. In fact, I'd almost like to shoot that forky more than that four point. Really? Because that four, there, yeah. the four point was what I, when he stood there tonight and looked at us. I'm guessing he's 23 inches wide, something like that. Yeah, tall. Yeah, nice, deep, deep nice back buck. forks. Yeah, nice, really nice back forks. But I don't know. I guess we'll just wait and see what happens. Yeah. I might die of frostbite in the morning. <laughs> Five degrees. I just hope the wind uh, isn't howling. Wow. It'll be elbow deep elbow deep in deer guts. I think so. Well, probably not guts. I guess we'll probably gutless method it, but Yeah. You know, back there. You keep it keep your hands warm at least, yeah. you know. Yeah, we saw some bull elk today that Oh yeah. Could easily stocked up on them, saw a cow moose. Two. Two? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. We saw one on each side of the mountain. 
Yeah. There's critters running around all over out here. We have not seen another hunter in a day and a half. No. That's there were some tracks, some some vehicle tracks. Right, but, but no not, other hunter. We've not seen a boot track. No. There's, I think there's 300 tags that were issued. They must know something we don't know. <laughs> That's what I was concluding that uh, this this hunt had last year a 34% success rate. And I'm thinking those guys who apply must be damn good archery mule deer hunters because if you gave me this tag 10 times, there's no way three and a half times or three times I'd be successful. <laughs> I just, maybe I would, I don't know. But we got our work cut out for us for sure. Mm-hmm. This is, everything always looks easier on paper. When you're researching <laughs> stats and, uh, you know, harvest statistics and this and that, it always looks easier. You get on oh, Onyx, yeah. Onyx Map and Google Earth, and it's like, oh, this looks, uh, yeah, It okay. looks a lot flatter when you're just yeah. looking down at the satellite imagery. Yeah. yeah. And then you get here, and you're <laughs> like, there could be a deer anywhere in here. How do I eliminate this? And chop it up into pieces I can chew on. Yeah. Which is kind of what we've done now. I think we've eliminated. I, there's still one more place we got to check out. Two, oh, yeah. Two more places we got to check out. But mm-hmm. we found a spot today where we were heavily into deer, just not not anything except that one nice buck. Mm-hmm. So, which is kind of the the art of showing up. I've never, I have never even driven through this place before. Yeah. I'd never seen it. I never anything. And so you, you just got to be able to show up through networking, through map reading, through research, a little bit of gut instinct and say, all right, here's the conditions. Here's the weather patterns for the last period of time. Where won't they be? And try not to go where they won't be. <laughs> Even though I managed that to makes, do that you're yesterday. Gonna get, you're going to get emails asking, so how how do I know where they won't be? <laughs> can, you, can you give me uh, I, the protocol for that? Yeah. Well, when I do uh, the elk hunting seminars, yeah. I tell people most of my scouting is trying to eliminate where elk aren't. Yeah. Once I eliminate where they won't be, yeah. the amount of places left isn't that great? Mm-hmm. And it allows me to really be focused. Yeah. And say I've got 10 spots left, probably six of those are going to hold elk. It's, it's kind of been mm-hmm. my experience. So anyhow, we better not get on another tangent. We've, <laughs> we've kept the audience way, way too long, folks. Can't thank you all enough for listening to this podcast. We are just, man, it is growing like crazy. Um, which is great for us. It's great for the message. It's great for the whole public land uh, advocacy. And uh, we're right now, because it's hunting season, you're hearing a lot of our podcasts from the field and, and just hunting stuff. Unfortunately, Congress is going to be seated. You know, we're going to get a new Congress in January. And they're already lining up in Congress to get rid of your public land. So come this winter you're probably going to hear a lot of Randy Newberg unfiltered when it comes to Congress and what they have in store for us. Anyhow, thanks for listening, folks. Hope you all have a great day. Take care.